Becoming a Person of Influence by John C. Maxwell and Jim Dornan, narrated by the authors. How can you make the change from successful individual to effective leader, team builder, and positive change agent? How can you reach out to people while reaching your maximum potential? No matter what your goals, building an organization, raising a family, improving your community or other worthwhile desires, you can achieve them by learning to positively influence people. Authors John C. Maxwell, founder of Enjoy, and Jim Dornan, president and owner of Network 21 International, have spent most of their lives raising up influencers and have positively impacted the lives of millions of people worldwide. With humor, heart, and unique insight, they share what they've gleaned from decades of experience. Whatever your vocation or aspiration, listen now as John C. Maxwell and Jim Dornan teach you how you can increase your positive impact on others by becoming a person of influence. When John and I met a few years ago, we sensed instantly that there was great chemistry between us, almost like that of brothers. We had so much in common. Yes, we did, despite our very different backgrounds. Jim, you spent the last 30 years in the business environment teaching people how to become successful. And in the process, you built a worldwide business organization. Yeah, and John, you've spent the last 28 years working in the nonprofit environment as a pastor, denominational executive, and motivational speaker. You're recognized as one of the top equippers in the United States in leadership and personal growth development. What we have in common, Jim, is an understanding of people and of the positive impact that one person's life can have on others. And it all boils down to one idea, influence. We know the power of influence, and we want to share it with you. So please join us and continue listening. We're going to give you many of our insights, tell some entertaining stories, and share dynamite principles that have the power to change your life and the lives of all the people you can influence. When you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you dream about being a famous actor or singer? How about President of the United States? Maybe you wanted to become an Olympic athlete or one of the wealthiest people in the world. We all have dreams and ambitions. Undoubtedly, you've accomplished some of yours. But no matter how successful you are now, you still have dreams and goals that are waiting to be fulfilled. And our desire is to help you realize those dreams, to help you realize your potential. Let's start by doing a little experiment. Listen to the following list of people. It's quite a diverse group, but they all have one thing in common. See if you can figure out what it is. John Grisham, George Gallup, Robert E. Lee, Dennis Rodman, James Dobson, Dan Rather, Madonna, Hideo Nomo, Jerry and Patty Beaumont, Rich DeVos, Mother Teresa, Pablo Picasso, Adolf Hitler, Tiger Woods, Glenn Leatherwood, Bill Clinton, John Wesley, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Have you figured out what all of them have in common? The answer is, every one of them is a person of influence. We created this list almost at random, selecting well-known people as well as ones from our own lives. We did it to make this point. Everyone is an influencer of other people. It doesn't matter who you are or what your occupation is. A politician, such as President of the United States, has tremendous influence on hundreds of millions of people, not only in his own country but around the globe. And entertainers, such as Madonna and Arnold Schwarzenegger, often influence an entire generation. A teacher, such as Glenn Leatherwood, who instructed John and hundreds of other boys in Sunday school, touches the lives of not only his own students, but also indirectly influences all the people those boys grow up to influence. But you don't have to be in a high-profile occupation to be a person of influence. In fact, if your life in any way connects with other people, you are an influencer. Everything you do at home, at church, in your job, or on the ball field has an impact on the lives of other people. As American poet, philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson said, every man is a hero and an oracle to somebody, and to that person, whatever he says has an enhanced value. If you desire to be successful, 
or to make a positive impact on your world, you need to become a person of influence. Without influence, there is no success. For example, if you're a salesperson wanting to sell more of your product, you need to be able to influence your customers. If you're a manager, your success depends on your ability to influence your employees. If you coach, you can only build a winning team if you can influence your players. If you're a pastor, your ability to reach people and grow your church depends on your influence with your congregation. If you want to raise a strong, healthy family, you have to be able to influence your children in a positive way. No matter what your goals are in life, you can achieve them faster, you can be more effective, and your contribution can be longer lasting if you learn how to become a person of influence. Influence doesn't come to us instantaneously. Instead, it grows by stages. Visually, it looks like a series of four stair steps. The bottom step is modeling. People are first influenced by what they see. If you have children, then you've probably observed this. No matter what you tell your children to do, their natural inclination is to follow what they see you doing. For most people, if they perceive that you are positive and trustworthy and have admirable qualities, then they will seek you as an influencer in their lives. And the better they get to know you, the greater your credibility will be and the higher your influence can become if they like what they see. Modeling can be a powerful influence, either positively or negatively, and it's something that can be done even from a distance. But if you want to make a really significant impact on the life of other people, you've got to do it from up close. And that brings you to the second level of influence, which is motivation. You become a motivational influencer when you begin to encourage people and communicate with them on an emotional level. The process does two things. It creates a bridge between you and them, and it builds up their confidence and sense of self-worth. When people feel good about you and themselves when they're with you, then your level of influence increases significantly. When you reach the motivational level of influence with others, you can start to see a positive impact in their lives. To increase that impact and make it long-lasting, you've got to move up to the third level of influence, which is mentoring. Mentoring is pouring your life into another person and helping him reach his potential. The power of mentoring is so strong that you can see the life of the person that you are influencing literally changing before your eyes. As you give of yourself, helping him overcome obstacles in his life and showing him how to grow personally and professionally, you help him achieve a whole new level of living. You can truly make a difference in his life. The fourth and highest level is multiplication. As a multiplying influencer, you help the people you're influencing to become positive influencers in the lives of others and pass on not only what they have received from you, but what they have learned and gleaned on their own. Few people ever make it to the fourth level of influence, but everyone has the potential to do so. It takes unselfishness, generosity, and commitment. It also takes time. As you move up to the higher levels of influence and become an active influencer, you can begin to have a positive influence on people and add value to their lives. That's true for any positive influencer. The babysitter who reads to a child encourages him to love books and become a lifelong learner. The teacher who puts his faith, confidence, and love in a little girl helps her to feel valued and good about herself. The boss who delegates to her employees and gives them authority as well as responsibility enlarges their horizons and empowers them to become better workers and people. The parents who know how and when to give their children grace help them to stay open and communicative even during their teenage years. All of these people add lasting value to the lives of others. We don't know what kind of influence you have on others today as you listen to this. Your actions may touch the lives of thousands of people, or you may be influencing two or three co-workers or family members. The number of people is not what's most important. The crucial thing to remember is that your level of influence is not static. Even if you've had a negative effect on others in the past, you can turn that around and make your impact a positive one. And if your level of influence has been relatively low up till now, you can increase it and become a person of influence who helps others. In fact, that's why we're talking with you now. We want to help you become a person of high influence. No matter what stage of life you're in or what you do for a living, you can have an incredibly positive impact on the lives of other people. You can add tremendous value to their lives. Let's talk about... Who's on the influence list? 
Everyone could sit down and make a list of people who have added value to their lives. We mentioned that the list at the beginning of this chapter contains the names of some of the people who have influenced us. Some of the names are big. For example, I consider 18th century evangelist John Wesley to be one of the greatest influencers of my life and career. Wesley was a great leader, preacher, and a social critic. During his lifetime, he turned the Christian church in England and America upside down, and his thoughts and teachings continue to influence the way churches function and Christians believe, even today. I consider Wesley to be the greatest person to have lived since the Apostle Paul. Other people whose names are on that list are not well known, but that in no way lessens their level of influence. For example, two people listed are Jerry and Patty Beaumont, a couple who had a profound impact on the lives of Jim and his wife Nancy. Here's their story. Nancy and I first met Jerry and Patty almost 25 years ago when Nancy and Patty were both pregnant. The Beaumonts were a classy couple, really sharp and confident. We were attracted to them immediately because it seemed like they really had their life together, and we observed that they were living out their strong spiritual convictions with integrity and consistency. Nancy met Patty one day while they were waiting together in the obstetrician's waiting room. They hit it off instantly and began to build a relationship. We had no idea how much their friendship was going to mean to us just a few months later when our lives got turned upside down. After nine months of routine pregnancy, Nancy gave birth to our first son, Eric. Well, at first everything appeared to be normal, but a few hours later the doctors discovered that Eric had been born with some very serious physical problems. His back was open and his spinal cord had not formed properly. They told us that he had a condition called spina bifida. To make things worse, his spinal fluid had gotten infected during the delivery, so he was suffering from severe systemic meningitis. Our whole life seemed to be thrown into chaos. After Nancy's hours of labor, we were exhausted, confused, and they told us Eric needed brain surgery. We had to make a decision right then. Without it, he didn't stand a chance, and even with it, things didn't look very good. We cried as they prepared to take our little boy, only a few hours old, and transport him to Children's Hospital for emergency brain surgery. All we could do was pray that he would make it. We waited for hours, but the doctors finally came out and told us Eric was going to live. We were shaken when we first saw him after the surgery. We wondered how someone so small could have so many wires attached to him. The opening in his back was now closed but we could see that they had surgically implanted a shunt tube in his brain to drain off excess spinal fluid and relieve the pressure. The first year of Eric's life was a blur for us as he repeatedly re-entered Children's Hospital. In the first nine months, he underwent 11 more surgeries. Three of those operations came in one weekend. Things were happening so fast that we were overwhelmed and we couldn't even comprehend what we might have to face in the future. While we were trying to survive the midnight trips to the hospital and hold up under the pain and fear we had for Eric, guess who came alongside us and helped us survive each day as it came? Jerry and Patty Beaumont. They had come to the hospital that first day of Eric's life and given us comfort and encouragement while he was in the operating room. They brought food for us and sat with Nancy and me in the hospital waiting rooms, and all the while they shared their incredible faith with us. Most importantly, they helped us to believe that God had a special plan for Eric and us, you know, Patty told Nancy one day, you and Jim can make Eric's problems the center of everything you do, or you can use them as a launching pad for a whole new way of looking at life. It was then that we turned a corner in our lives. We began looking beyond our circumstances and saw that there was a bigger picture. We realized God had a plan for us as well as Eric, and our faith gave us strength and peace. The Beaumonts had helped us consider and answer some of life's most important questions. From that day on, our entire attitudes changed, and we had great hope. That was over two decades ago. Jim and Nancy lost touch with the Beaumonts, though they have since tried to find them. Now Eric has grown up and gets around pretty well in his electric wheelchair, despite having experienced a stroke during one of his surgeries. He's a constant source of joy, inspiration, and humor for the Dornan family. And though their contact with Jerry and Patty Beaumont lasted only about a year, Jim and Nancy recognized the tremendous value they added to them and still consider them to be two of the greatest influencers in their lives. Today, Jim and Nancy are themselves people of great influence. Their business has expanded into more than 26 countries around the world, from Eastern Europe to the Pacific, from Brazil and Argentina to mainland China. 
Through seminars, tapes, and videos, they impact hundreds of thousands of individuals and families each year, and their business continues to grow. But more important to them, they are sharing their strong values and faith with people that they influence. They are doing all they can to add value to the lives of everyone they touch. We don't know exactly what your dream is in life or what kind of legacy you want to leave. But if you want to make an impact, you will have to become a man or woman capable of influencing others. There is no other way to effectively touch people's lives. And if you do become a person of influence, then maybe someday when other people write down the names of those who made a difference in their lives, your name just might be on that list. Chapter 1 a person of influence has integrity with people. A few years ago, while my wife Nancy and I were on a business trip to Europe, we celebrated her birthday in London. As her gift, I decided to take her to the Escada boutique to buy her an outfit or two. She tried on a number of things and liked all of them. And while she was in the dressing room trying to decide which one to pick, I told the salesperson to wrap up the whole lot. Nancy tried to protest. She was embarrassed to buy so many things at one time, but I insisted... We both knew she'd get good use out of the clothes. Besides, she looked fabulous in everything. A couple of days later, we took a long flight out of Heathrow Airport in London to San Francisco International. After we landed, we got in line for the inevitable customs check. When they asked what we had to declare, we told them about the clothes Nancy had bought and the amount we had spent. What? <laughs> the agent said. You're declaring clothes? He read the figure that we had written down and said, You've got to be kidding. It's true that we had spent a little bit of money on them, but we didn't think it was that big a deal. What are the clothes made of, he asked. That seemed like an odd question. A bunch of different things, answered Nancy. Wool, cotton, silk, everything's different. There are dresses, coats, blouses, shoes, belts, accessories. Why? Each kind of fabric has a different duty, he said. I'll have to get my supervisor. I don't even know what all the different rates are. Nobody declares clothes. He looked frustrated. Go ahead and pull everything out and sort it out according to what it's made of. It must have taken us a good 45 minutes to sort everything out and tally up how much we'd spent on each type of item. The duty turned out to be quite a bit, a couple of thousand dollars. As we were putting everything back into our suitcase, the agent said, You know what? I think I know you. Aren't you Jim Dornan? Yeah, I answered. I'm sorry if we met before. I didn't recognize him. No, he said, but I've got a friend who's in your organization, Network 21, right? That's right, I said. I've seen your picture before. You know, the agent said, my friend's been telling me that I'd really benefit from hooking up with your organization. But I haven't really listened. Now I'm thinking I should reconsider. He might be right after all. See, most people I see every day try to get all kinds of things through customs without paying duty, even stuff they should know better about. But you guys... You're declaring stuff you could have gotten through with no problem. That's sure a lot of money you could have saved. That may be true, answered Nancy, but I can spare the money for customs a lot more than I can spare not having a clear conscience. As we stood in line that day, it didn't even occur to Nancy or me that anyone there might know us. If our intention had been to cheat our way through, we never would have suspected that we'd be recognized. We thought we were anonymous. And I think that is what a lot of people think as they cut corners in life. Who will ever know, they say to themselves... But the truth is that other people know, your spouse, children, friends, business associates all know. And more importantly, even if you cover your tracks really well and they don't know what you're up to, you do. And you don't want to give away or sell your integrity for any price. Jim's experience with a customs agent is just one small example of how people today think when it comes to integrity. Sadly, it no longer appears to be the norm. And when confronted by an example of honest character in action, many people seem shocked. Common decency is no longer common. Genuine integrity is not for sale. You can see character issues coming up in every aspect of life. A few years ago, for example, financier Ivan Bosky openly described greed as a good thing while speaking at UCLA's business school. That kind of flawed thinking soon got him into trouble. When his unethical practices on Wall Street came to light, he was fined $100 million and sent to prison for three years. Recently, he was reported to be ruined financially and living on alimony from his former wife. Government hasn't been immune to integrity issues either. 
The Department of Justice says it is prosecuting public officials as never before, and it recently boasted that it had convicted over 1,100 in one year. A dubious record. TV preachers fall morally. Mothers drown their own children. Professional athletes are found in hotel rooms with drugs and prostitutes. The list keeps growing. It seems that many people look at integrity as an outdated idea, something expendable, or no longer applicable to them in our fast-paced world. But the need for integrity today is perhaps as great as it has ever been, and it is absolutely essential for anyone who desires to become a person of influence. Cheryl Beal says, One of the realities of life is that if you can't trust a person at all points, you can't truly trust him or her at any point. That's why it's crucial to maintain integrity by taking care of the little things. Many people misunderstand that. They think they can do whatever they want when it comes to the small things because they believe as long as they don't have any major lapses, they're doing well. Well, that's not the way it works. Webster's New Universal Unabridged Dictionary describes integrity as adherence to moral and ethical principles, soundness of moral character, honesty. Ethical principles are not flexible. A little white lie is still a lie. Theft is theft, whether it's one dollar, one thousand dollars, or one million dollars. Integrity commits itself to character over personal gain, to people over things, to service over power, to principle over convenience, to the long view over the immediate. 19th century clergyman Phillips Brooks said, Character is made in the small moments of our lives. Anytime you break a moral principle, you create a small crack in the foundation of your integrity. And when times get tough, it becomes harder to act with integrity, not easier. Character isn't created in a crisis. It only comes to light. Everything you have done in the past and the things you have neglected to do come to a head when you're under pressure. Integrity is your best friend. The great 19th century American writer Nathaniel Hawthorne said, No man can for any considerable time wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which is the true one. Anytime you compromise your integrity, you do yourself an incredible amount of damage. That's because integrity really is your best friend. It will never betray you or put you in a compromising position. It helps keep your priorities right. When you're tempted to take shortcuts, it helps you stay the right course. Abraham Lincoln once said, When I lay down the reins of this administration, I want to have one friend left, and that friend is inside myself. You could almost say that Lincoln's integrity was his best friend while he was in office, because he was criticized so viciously. Here is a description of what he faced as explained by Donald T. Phillips. Abraham Lincoln was slandered, libeled, and hated perhaps more intensely than any man ever to run for the nation's highest office. He was publicly called just about every name imaginable by the press of the day, including a grotesque baboon, a third-rate country lawyer who once split rails and now splits the Union, a coarse, vulgar joker, a dictator, an ape, a buffoon, and other names. The Illinois State Register labeled him the craftiest and most dishonest politician that ever disgraced an office in America. Severe and unjust criticism did not subside after Lincoln took the oath of office, nor did it come only from Southern sympathizers. It came from within the Union itself, from Congress, from some factions within the Republican Party, and initially from within his own cabinet. As president, Lincoln learned that no matter what he did, there were going to be people who would not be pleased. Through it all, Lincoln was a man of principle, and as Thomas Jefferson said, God grant that men of principle shall be our principal men. Integrity is your friend's best friend. Not only is integrity your best friend, it's one of the best friends that your friends will ever have. When the people around you know that you're a person of integrity, they know that you want to influence them because of the opportunity to add value to their lives. They don't have to worry about your motives. Recently, we saw a cartoon in The New Yorker that showed how difficult it can be to sort out another person's motives. A group of hogs was assembled for a feeding, and a farmer was filling their trough to the brim. One of the pigs turned to the others and said, Have you ever wondered why he's being so good to us? A person of integrity influences others because he wants to bring something to the table that will benefit them, not put them on the table to benefit himself. 
the benefit of integrity is trust. The bottom line when it comes to integrity is that it allows others to trust you. And without trust, you have nothing. Trust is the single most important factor in personal and professional relationships. It is the glue that holds people together. And it is a key to becoming a person of influence. The benefit of trust is influence. When you earn people's trust, then you begin to earn their confidence. And that is one of the keys to influence. As President Dwight D. Eisenhower said, In order to be a leader, a man must have followers. And to have followers, a man must have their confidence. Hence, the supreme quality for a leader is unquestionably integrity. Without it, no real success is possible, no matter whether it is on a section gang or a football field, in the army, or in an office. If a man's associates find that he lacks forthright integrity, he will fail. His teachings and actions must square with each other. The first great need, therefore, is integrity and high purpose. In the end, you can bend your actions to conform to your principles, or you can bend your principles to conform to your actions. It's a choice you have to make. If you want to become a person of influence, then you'd better choose the path of integrity, because all other roads ultimately lead to ruin. It is almost impossible to overestimate the impact of integrity in the lives of people. You probably remember the Tylenol scare from years ago. Several people were found poisoned to death, and investigators traced the cause back to some contaminated Tylenol capsules. My friend Don Meyer sent me a commentary on the incident a while back. Here's what it said. Some years earlier in their mission statement, they had a line saying that they would operate with honesty and integrity. Several weeks before the Tylenol incident, the president of Johnson & Johnson sent a memo to all presidents of divisions of the company asking if they were abiding by and if they believed in the mission statement. All of the presidents came back with an affirmative answer. Reportedly, within an hour of the Tylenol crisis, the president of the company ordered all capsules off the shelf knowing that it was a $100 million decision. When reporters asked how he could decide so easily and rapidly on such a major decision, his reply was, I was practicing what we agreed on in our mission statement. At the bottom of the commentary, Don Meyer wrote this note, John, it is always easy to do right when you know ahead of time what you stand for. What's true for Johnson & Johnson is true for you and for us. If you know what you stand for and act accordingly, people can trust you. You are a model of the kind of character and consistency that other people admire and want to emulate. And you've laid a good foundation, one that makes it possible for you to become a person of positive influence in their lives. Chapter 2 A Person of Influence Nurtures Other People Several years ago, Nancy and I decided that we wanted to help our son, Eric, become a little more independent. In general, he does really well. In fact, he participates in many activities that someone who's not bound by a wheelchair never gets to. But we thought he'd enjoy taking another step in his personal development, so we looked into something we'd heard about called Canine Companions for Independence, an organization that matches specially trained dogs to people with disabilities. Eric loved the idea of getting a dog, and we applied to receive one that would match his needs. For the next several weeks, we waited. And not a day went by that Eric didn't talk about it. Finally, one afternoon, we received a call from CCI telling us that they had a dog for Eric, and the next morning we took off for their center in Oceanside, California. Eric fell in love with Sable immediately. She was an energetic golden retriever who was a little over a year and a half old. The two of them went through boot camp and learned how to work together. Sable could turn lights off and on for Eric, accompany him to the store with money, and carry his purchases back for him and a bunch of other things. As boot camp was coming to a close, one of the trainers sat down with Eric and talked with him. He said, Eric, no matter what else you do or don't do with Sable, be sure of one thing. You have to be the one who feeds her. That's very important. It's the only way to be sure that she will bond with you and look to you as her master. For Eric, giving the dog love and affection was easy. He enjoyed petting and grooming her, but it was harder for him to learn how to take charge. He has a pretty docile personality, but in time, he learned to feed her, and it eventually became his favorite part of their routine.
Feeding a dog is the best way to create a relationship with her. It not only provides what the dog needs, giving her life and strength, but it teaches her to trust and follow you. And in most cases, when you do the feeding, the care you give is returned with loyalty, obedience, and affection. In some ways, people respond very similarly to the way some animals do. And like animals, people need to be cared for not just physically, but emotionally. If you look around, you'll discover that there are people in your life who want to be fed with encouragement, recognition, security, and hope. That process is called nurturing, and it's a need that every human being has. If you desire to become an influencer in another person's life, the way to start is by nurturing him or her. Many people mistakenly believe that the way to become an influencer in the life of another person is to become an authority figure, correct their errors, reveal their weak areas they can't easily see in themselves, and give so-called constructive criticism. But what clergyman John Knox said over 400 years ago is still true. You cannot antagonize and influence at the same time. At the heart of the nurturing process is genuine concern for others. When you hear the word nurture, what do you first think of? If you're like most people, you probably envision a mother cradling a baby. She takes care of her child, protecting it, feeding it, encouraging it, making sure that its needs are met. She doesn't give it attention only when she's got spare time or when it's convenient. She loves it and wants it to thrive. Similarly, as we try to help and influence the people around us, we must also have positive feelings and concerns for them. If you want to help people and make a positive impact on them, you cannot dislike, despise, or disparage them. You must give love to them and give them respect. Or, as human relations expert Les Giblin says, you can't make the other fellow feel important in your presence if you secretly feel that he is a nobody. You may be wondering why you should take on a nurturing role with the people you want to influence, especially if they are employees, colleagues, or friends, not family members. You may be saying to yourself, isn't that something they can get somewhere else, like at home? The unfortunate truth is most people are desperate for encouragement, and even if they have a few people in their lives who build them up, you still need to become a nurturer to them, because people are influenced most by those who make them feel the best about themselves. If you become a major nurturer in the life of another person, then you have an opportunity to make a major impact on them. The key to becoming a nurturer is learning to be other-minded. Instead of thinking of yourself, Learn to put others first. Instead of putting others in their place, try to put yourself in their place. That's not always easy. Only when you have a sense of peace about yourself and who you are will you be able to be other-minded and give yourself away to others. But the rewards of nurturing are great. When you nurture people, they receive a great deal, including these five things. Number one, positive self-worth. Nathaniel Brandon, a psychiatrist and expert on the subject of self-esteem, has stated that no factor is more decisive in people's psychological development and motivation than the value judgments they make about themselves. He says that the nature of self-evaluation has a profound effect on a person's values, beliefs, thinking processes, feelings, needs, and goals. In his view, self-esteem is the single most significant key to a person's behavior. If you want to help a person improve his quality of life, become more productive at work, and develop more positive relationships, then build his self-worth. Make him feel good about himself, and the positive benefits will spill over in every aspect of his life. And when he begins to experience those benefits, he will be grateful to you. Number two, sense of belonging. Positive influencers understand people's needs for a sense of belonging and do things that make people feel included. Parents make sure their children feel like important members of the family. Spouses make the person to whom they are married feel like a cherished equal partner. And bosses let their employees know that they are valued members of the team. Great leaders are particularly talented at making their followers feel that they belong. Napoleon Bonaparte, for example, was a master at making people feel important and included. He was known for wandering through the camp and greeting every officer by name. 
As he talked to each man, he would ask about his hometown, wife, and family. And the general would talk about a battle or maneuver in which he knew the man had taken part. The interest and time he took with his followers made them feel a great sense of camaraderie and belonging. It's no wonder that his men were devoted to him. Number three, perspective. For most people, it's not what they are that holds them back. It's what they think they're not. Everyone appreciates being nurtured, even great men and women. A small exhibit at the Smithsonian Institution bears this out. It contains the personal effects found on Abraham Lincoln the night that he was shot. A small handkerchief embroidered, A. Lincoln, a country boy's penknife, a spectacle case repaired with cotton string, a Confederate $5 bill, and a worn-out newspaper clipping extolling his accomplishments as president. It begins, Abe Lincoln is one of the greatest statesmen of all time. As we mentioned in the previous chapter, Lincoln faced fierce criticism while in office, and it would have been easy for him to become totally discouraged. That article, worn with repeated reading, undoubtedly helped him during very difficult times. It nurtured him along and helped him retain his perspective. Number four, feeling of significance. Woody Allen once said, My only regret in life is that I'm not someone else. And while he probably said that to get a laugh, with the relationship problems he's had over the years, we can't help wondering how much truth there is in his comment. In fact, the price tag that the world puts on us is almost identical to the one we put on ourselves. People who have a great deal of self-respect and who believe that they have significance are usually respected and made to feel valued by others. When you nurture people and add value to them without expecting anything in return, they feel significant. They realize that they are valued, that they matter to others, and once they consistently feel positive about themselves, then they're free to live more positively for themselves and others. Number five, hope. Writer Mark Twain said, Keep away from people who try to belittle your ambitions. Small people always do that, but the really great people make you feel that you, too, can become great. How do most people feel when they're around you? Do they feel small and insignificant, or do they believe in themselves and have great hope about what they can become? Hope is perhaps the greatest gift that you can give another person as a result of nurturing because even if a person's sense of self is weak and he fails to see his own significance, he still has a reason to keep trying and striving to reach his potential in the future. The key to how you treat people lies in how you think about them. It's a matter of attitude. What you believe is revealed by how you act. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said, Treat a man as he appears to be and you make him worse but treat a man as if he already were what he potentially could be, and you make him what he should be. How to become a natural nurturer. Maybe you weren't born a nurturing person. Many people find it hard to be loving and positive to others, especially if the environment they grew up in wasn't particularly uplifting. But anyone can become a great nurturer and add value to others. If you cultivate a positive attitude of other-mindedness, you too can become a natural at nurturing and enjoy the added privilege of influence in the lives of others. Here's how to do it. First, commit to them. Make a commitment to becoming a nurturer. When you make a commitment to helping people, it changes your priorities and your actions. Love for others always finds a way to help. Indifference to others finds nothing but excuses. Second, believe in them. People rise or fall to meet the expectations of those closest to them. Give people your trust and hope, and they will do everything they can not to let you down. Third, be accessible to them. You can't nurture anyone from a distance. You can only do it up close. When you first start the process with people, you may need to spend a lot of time with them. But as they gain confidence in themselves and the relationship, they will require less personal contact. Until they reach that point, make sure they have good access to you. Fourth, Give with no strings attached. If you need people, you cannot lead them. And nurturing is an aspect of leadership. Instead of trying to make a transaction out of it, give freely without expecting anything in return. Henry Drummond said, 
you will find as you look back upon your life that the moments when you have really lived are the moments when you have done things in a spirit of love. Fifth, give them opportunities. As the people you nurture gain strength, give them additional opportunities to succeed and grow. You will continue to nurture them, but as time goes by, their own actions and accomplishments will help to keep them secure, respected, and encouraged. And finally, sixth, lift them to a higher level. Your ultimate goal should always be to help people go to a higher level, to reach their potential. Nurturing is the foundation upon which the person can begin the building process. One of the greatest stories of encouragement and nurturing that we've ever heard is about John Wesley, one of the influencers we mentioned in this book's introduction. In 1791, Wesley wrote a letter to a man named William Wilberforce, a member of England's parliament who was in the midst of fighting for the abolition of the British slave trade. The letter, which has since become famous, said this. London, February 26, 1791. Dear Sir, Unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing that execrable villainy, which is the scandal of religion, of England, and of human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them stronger than God? Oh, be not weary in well-doing. Go on, in the name of God and in the power of His might, till even American slavery, the vilest that ever saw the sun, shall vanish away before it. That He who has guided you from your youth up may continue to strengthen you in this and all things is the prayer of your affectionate servant, John Wesley. Four days later, Wesley was dead at the age of 88. Yet his influence in Wilberforce's life continued for years. Wilberforce did not succeed in convincing Parliament to abolish slavery at that time, but he didn't give up the fight. He kept at it for decades despite slander, vilification, and threats. And when he thought he couldn't go on any farther, he looked to Wesley's letter for encouragement. Finally, in 1807, the slave trade was abolished. And in 1833, several months after Wilberforce's death, slavery was outlawed in all of the British Empire. Though condemned by many during his career, Wilberforce was buried with honor in Westminster Abbey, one of the most esteemed men of his day. Part of his epitaph reads, Eminent as he was in every department of public labor, and a leader in every work of charity, whether to relieve the temporal or the spiritual wants of his fellow men, his name will be specially identified with those exertions, which by the blessing of God removed from England the guilt of the African slave trade and prepared the way for the abolition of slavery in every colony of the empire. Maybe there is a William Wilberforce in your life just waiting to be nurtured to greatness. The only way you'll ever know is to become a nurturer who is other-minded and adds value to the people he meets. Chapter 3 a person of influence has faith in people. Jim grew up in Niagara Falls, New York. Today the population is about 60,000, but back when Jim lived there it was closer to 100,000 people. It was a thriving industrial center with companies such as DuPont Chemical. It also had cultural offerings, a strong 100-year-old university and other attractions. But the main focus of the town back then was the incredible natural wonder of the falls, as it still is today. The Iroquois Indians called it Niagara, meaning thunder of waters. It's an awesome sight. Every minute, more than 12 million cubic feet of water drops a distance of about 180 feet over the edge of the falls. And its total width, including both Canadian and American portions, measures over 3,100 feet. It is rightly called one of the natural wonders of the world. Back when we were growing up, we heard a lot of stories about the falls and the daredevil stunts people used to pull, like Annie Edson Taylor's going over the falls in a barrel and things like that. One of the great legends of the town was a French acrobat named Charles Blondin, who lived from 1824 to 1897. He crossed over the entire width of the falls on a tightrope back in 1859. 
That must have taken nerves of steel, since a fall certainly would have killed him. In fact, he crossed the falls several times. He did it once with a wheelbarrow, another time blindfolded, and yet another time on stilts. They say he was quite remarkable. He continued performing even into his seventies. One of the most incredible feats he performed was crossing the falls on a tightrope while carrying a man on his back. Can you imagine that? I guess just crossing over by himself wasn't tough enough for him. But as difficult as that feat might have been on Blondin, I can't help wondering how he got someone to go with him. That's what you call trust, to climb onto the back of a man who's going to walk more than half a mile on a rope suspended over one of the most powerful waterfalls in the world. I used to think about that as a kid. What would it be like to see the falls from up on a rope above them? And more importantly, what person would trust me to carry him across the falls the way that man trusted Blondin? We can't tell you the identity of the man Blondin carried across the falls, but there's no question that he had great faith in the French acrobat. After all, he put his life in the man's hands. You don't see that kind of trust in others every day. But the times you do, it's a very special thing. Faith in people is one of the most important qualities an influencer can have when working with others. Yet it's quite a scarce commodity today. Listen to the following four facts about faith. Number one, most people don't have faith in themselves. Number two, most people don't have someone who has faith in them. Number three, most people can tell when someone has faith in them. And number four, most people will do anything to live up to your faith in them. People rise or fall to meet our level of expectations for them. If you express skepticism and doubt in others, they'll return your lack of confidence with mediocrity. But if you believe in them and expect them to do well, they will go the extra mile trying to do their best. And in the process, both of you will benefit. John H. Spalding expressed the thought this way when he said, Those who believe in our ability do more than stimulate us. They create for us an atmosphere in which it becomes easier to succeed. If you've never been one to trust people and put faith in them, change your way of thinking and begin believing in others. Your life will quickly begin to improve. When you have faith in another person, you give him or her an incredible gift. Maybe the best gift you can give another person. Faith is belief in action. Having faith in people requires more than just words or even just positive feelings about people. It has to be backed up with what we do. As Point Loma College professor Emeritus W.T. Perkheiser said, Faith is more than thinking something is true. Faith is thinking something is true to the extent that we act on it. If you want to help other people and make a positive impact on their lives, you have to treat them with that kind of confidence. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Trust men and they will be true to you. Treat them greatly and they will show themselves great. Become a believer in others, and even the most tentative and inexperienced people can bloom right before your eyes. How to Become a Believer in People We're fortunate because we grew up in positive, affirming environments. As a result, we have an easy time believing in people and expressing that belief. When you have faith in yourself, it is easy to have faith in others. But we realize that not everyone has the benefit of that kind of positive upbringing. Most people need to learn how to have faith in others. To help build your belief in others, try using these six suggestions created using the initial letters of the word BELIEVE. B is for believe in them before they succeed. Everyone loves a winner. It's easy to have faith in people who've already proven themselves. It's much tougher to believe in people before they've proven themselves. But that's the key to motivating people to reach their potential. You have to believe in them first, before they become successful, and sometimes before they even believe in themselves. There are people in your life who desperately want to believe in themselves, but who have very little hope. As you interact with them, remember the motto of French World War I hero, Marshal Ferdinand Foch. There are no hopeless situations. There are only men and women who have grown hopeless about them. Every person has seeds of greatness within, even though they may currently be laying dormant. But when you believe in people, you water those seeds and give them the chance to grow. Every time you put your faith in them, you're giving life-sustaining water, warmth, food, and light. 
And if you continue to give encouragement through your belief in them, these people will bloom in time. E is for emphasize their strengths. We mentioned previously that many people mistakenly think that to be influential in other people's lives, they have to be an authority and point out their deficiencies. The best way to show people your faith in them and motivate them is to focus your attention on their strengths. According to author and advertising executive Bruce Barton, nothing splendid has ever been achieved except by those who dared believe that something inside them was superior to circumstances. When you emphasize people's strengths, you're helping them believe that they possess what they need to succeed. L is for list their past successes. Even when you spend your time emphasizing people's strengths, they may still need further encouragement to show them you believe in them and to get them motivated. Entrepreneur Mary Kay Ash says, Everyone has an invisible sign hanging from his neck saying, Make me feel important. Never forget this message when working with people. One of the best ways to do that is to help people to remember their past successes. If you can show others that they've done well in the past and help them see their past victories have paved the way for future success, they'll be better able to move into action. Listing past successes helps others believe in themselves. I is for instill confidence when they fail. When you've encouraged people and put your faith in them, and they begin to believe they can succeed in life, they soon reach a critical crossroads. The first time or two that they fail, and they will fail because it's a part of life, they have two choices. They can give in or go on. To give them a push and inspire them, you need to keep showing your confidence in them, even when they're making mistakes or doing poorly. In time, they will learn to think the way baseball legend Babe Ruth did when he said, Never let the fear of striking out get in the way. E is for experience some wins together. It's not enough just knowing that failure is part of moving forward in life. To really become motivated to succeed, people need to believe they can win. John, like many of us, got a taste for winning when he was just a kid. That's right, Jim. Growing up, I idolized my brother Larry, who is two and a half years older than I am. After my parents, he was probably the greatest influencer in my life when I was a kid. Larry has always been a leader and an excellent athlete. And whenever we played basketball, football, or baseball with the kids in the neighborhood, Larry was the captain. A lot of times when they picked up teams, I would be one of the last picked because I was younger and smaller than most of the kids. But as I got older, Larry began picking me more and more, and that began to make me feel good, not only because it meant my brother cared about me, but because I knew that when Larry picked me, I was going to be on the winning team. You see, Larry was a fierce competitor, and he didn't like losing. He always played to win, and he usually did. Together, we put quite a few wins under our belts, and I came to expect victory when I played with my brother. Winning is motivating. Novelist David Ambrose said, If you have the will to win, you have achieved half your success. If you don't, you have achieved half your failure. When you can come alongside others to help them experience some wins with you, it gives them reasons to believe they will succeed. And in the process, they begin to sense victory. That's when incredible things begin to happen in their lives. V is for Visualize Their Future Success. It's been said that a person can live 40 days without food, 4 days without water, 4 minutes without air, but only 4 seconds without hope. Each time you cast vision for others and paint a picture of their future success, you build them up, motivate them, and give them reasons to keep on going. E is for expect a new level of living. German statesman Konrad Adenauer observed, We all live under the same sky, but we don't all have the same horizon. As an influencer, your goal is to help others see beyond today and their current circumstances and dream big dreams. When you put your faith in people, you help them expand their horizons and motivate them to move to a whole new level of living. The key to that new way of living is a change in attitude. Dennis Waitley said, The winner's edge is not in a gifted birth, a high IQ, or in talent. The winner's edge is all in the attitude, not aptitude. Attitude is the criterion for success. 
as people's attitudes change from doubt to confidence in themselves and their ability to succeed and reach their potential, everything in their lives changes for the better. Jim, I know you and Nancy gained incredible insights about the power of putting faith into others several years ago when you decided to take a chance with your son Eric on a mountain in Utah. That's true. About five years ago, Nancy and I got the idea that we should take Eric skiing. She had heard from a friend about a place in Park City, Utah, called the National Ability Center. There they offer people with disabilities instruction and assistance in snow skiing, swimming, tennis, water skiing, horseback riding, rafting, and other activities. She thought the experience would be great for his self-esteem. I have to admit, I was skeptical about it from the very beginning. I had trouble imagining Eric racing down a 10,000-foot mountain, knowing how difficult the sport is for me. And that wasn't helped by the knowledge that a blow to his head could cause him to have a seizure or put him in the hospital for more brain surgery. But Nancy had faith that Eric could do it. And when she believes, so does he. And off we went to give it a try. When we got up to Deer Valley and met some of the people who work at the National Ability Center, I started to feel a little bit better about it. They were professional and extremely positive. They showed us the equipment that Eric would be using a type of bi-ski with a molded seat, Eric would be put in the chair and steer using a bar attached to little outrigger skis. When we started to fill out the paperwork, we were momentarily paralyzed when we read the waiver that said Eric would be, quote, engaging in activities that involve risk of serious injury, including permanent disability and death, unquote. <laughs> it made the risk seem very real, but by this time Eric was very excited and we didn't want him to see any hesitation from us. After Velcro fastening Eric into his bi-ski and giving him some pointers, Stephanie, his young instructor, took him up the bunny slope. About ten minutes later, we got excited as we saw Eric coming down the hill with the biggest smile on his face. We were so proud of him that we were giving him high fives and patting him on the back. I thought to myself, well, that wasn't so bad. Then off they went again. What we didn't know was that this time they were going to the top of the mountain. At the bottom of the hill, we waited and waited we weren't sure whether we'd see Eric come down the mountain on his skis or on a stretcher with a ski patrol. Finally, after about 30 minutes, we saw him and Stephanie come around a bend and ski to the bottom of the slope. His cheeks were flushed, and he was grinning like a Chesser cat. He loved it. Move over, Dad, he said as he blew past us. I'm going up again. Eric skied every day on that trip. In fact, when he was done skiing one day, he told us, Stephanie didn't take me up the mountain today. Oh, said Nancy, then who skied with you? Some one-legged guy, answered Eric. What? Nancy said, what do you mean, some one-legged guy? Yep, said Eric, a one-legged guy. And then Eric smiled mischievously and said, want to know how he lost his leg? Avalanche. <laughs> Eric's been skiing every year since then, and his life hasn't been the same since. He's now got a confidence he never had before, and he's willing to try just about anything. He swims three days a week. He works out with weights, plays power soccer. I guess you could say that he has adopted the motto of the National Ability Center as his own. If I can do this, I can do anything. If they had done things Jim's way, Eric might not have gotten the chance to experience what he did on the mountain in Utah five years ago. Jim loves Eric with all of his heart, but he tends to want to play it safe. Putting your faith in others does involve taking a chance. But the rewards so outweigh the risk that there is no comparison. Robert Louis Stevenson said, To be what we are and to become what we are capable of becoming is the only end in life. When you put your faith in others, you help them reach their potential, and you become an important influencer in their lives. Chapter number four. A person of influence listens to people. If you're going on a job interview today, what would you say is the most important skill that you would need? Is it writing to create a knockout resume? Or maybe salesmanship, after all. Isn't that what you're there to do on an interview? Sell yourself? Or how about charisma? If you're charismatic, you're sure to get the job you want, right? Or let's say that instead of going out on an interview, you are going to spend your day recruiting, whether for business prospects, ministry workers, or people to play on your softball team. What kind of skill would you need as a recruiter? Discernment? An eye for talent? 
the ability to cast vision and get people excited. Or maybe it would be hard-nosed negotiation skills. Better yet, let's say your job today was to supply new ideas for your organization. What qualities would you need? Creativity? Intelligence? Would you need a good education? What is the number one ability you would need? No matter which one of these three tasks you were to take on today, there is one skill that you would need over all the others, more than talent, discernment, or charm. It is the one skill that all great leaders recognize as indispensable to their ability to influence others and succeed. Have you guessed what it is? It's the ability to listen. When President Lyndon B. Johnson was a junior senator from Texas, he kept a sign on his office wall that read, You ain't learning nothing when you're doing all the talking. And Woodrow Wilson, the 28th American president, once said, The ear of the leader must ring with the voices of the people. The ability to skillfully listen is one of the keys to gaining influence with others. It shows respect, builds relationships, increases knowledge, generates ideas, and builds loyalty. It also is a great way to help others while helping yourself. When you become a good listener, you have the ability to develop strong relationships, gather valuable information, and increase your understanding of yourself and others. As our friend Zig Ziglar says, you can get everything in life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. When you listen to others, you put yourself in a place where you can give that help. Listening is one of the most valuable skills that you will ever develop. According to Brian Adams, author of Sales Cybernetics, during the average waking day, we spend the best part of it listening. He offers the following statistics. 9% of the day is spent writing. 16% of the day is spent reading. 30% of the day is spent speaking. 45% of the day is spent listening. In order to become a good listener, you have to want to hear. But you also need some skills to help you with that process. Here are nine suggestions to help you become a better listener. Number one, look at the speaker. The whole listening process begins with giving the other person your undivided attention. As you interact with others, don't catch up on other work, shuffle papers, do the dishes, or watch television. Set aside the time to focus only on the other person. And if you don't have the time right at that moment, then schedule it as soon as you can. Number two, don't interrupt. Most people react badly to being interrupted. It makes them feel disrespected. And according to Robert L. Montgomery, author of Listening Made Easy, it's just as rude to step on people's ideas as it is to step on their toes. If you are in the habit of interrupting other people, examine your motives and determine to make a change. Give people the time they need to express themselves. And don't feel that one of you has to be speaking all the time. Periods of silence can be good. They give you a chance to reflect on what's been said so that you can respond appropriately. Number three, focus on understanding. Have you ever noticed how quickly most people forget the things they hear? We're told that studies at institutions such as Michigan State, Ohio State, Florida State, and the University of Minnesota indicate that most people can recall only 50% of what they hear immediately after hearing it. And as time passes, their ability to remember continues to drop. By the next day, their retention is usually down to about 25%. One of the ways to combat that tendency is to make your goal understanding rather than just remembering facts. Herb Cohen says, Effective listening requires more than hearing the words transmitted. It demands that you find meaning and understanding in what is being said. After all, meanings are not in the words, but in people. Put yourself in the other person's place and your ability to understand will increase. And the greater your ability to understand, the better listener you will become. Number four, determine the need at the moment. One of the greatest keys to becoming an effective listener is the ability to discern the other person's need at the moment. People talk for so many different reasons. To receive comfort, to vent, to persuade, to inform, to be understood or to relieve nervousness. Often people talk to you for reasons that don't match your expectations. For example, a lot of men and women find themselves in conflict because they occasionally communicate at crossed purposes. They neglect to determine the need of the other person at the moment of interaction. Men usually want to fix any problem that they discuss. 
Their need is resolution. Women, on the other hand, are more likely to tell about a problem they have simply to share it. Solutions are often neither requested nor desired. Anytime you can determine the current need of the people you're communicating with, you can put whatever they say into the appropriate context, and you will be better able to understand them. Number five, check your emotions. Just about everyone carries around some emotional baggage that causes them to react to certain people or situations. Any time that you find yourself becoming highly emotional when listening to another person, then check your emotions, especially if your reaction seems to be stronger than the situation warrants. You don't want to make some unsuspecting person the recipient of your venting. Besides, even if your reactions are not due to some event from your past, you should always allow others to finish explaining their points of view, ideas, or convictions before offering your own. Number six, suspend your judgment. Have you ever begun listening to another person tell a story and started to respond to it before he or she was finished? Just about everyone has. But the truth is you can't jump to conclusions and be a good listener at the same time. As you talk to others, wait to hear the whole story before you respond. If you don't, you may miss the most important thing they intend to say. Number seven, sum up at major intervals. John H. Melsinger suggests... Comment on what you hear and individualize your comments. For example, you can say, Cheryl, that's obviously very important to you. It will help keep you on track as a listener. Get beyond, that's interesting. If you train yourself to comment meaningfully, the speaker will know that you're listening and may offer further information. One of the best techniques for active listening is to sum up what the other person says at major intervals. As the speaker finishes one subject, paraphrase his or her main points or ideas before going on to the next one and verify that you've gotten the right message. It reassures that person and helps you to stay focused on what he or she is trying to communicate. Number eight, ask questions for clarity. Have you ever noticed that top reporters are excellent listeners? Take someone like Barbara Walters, for example. She practices great listening skills. She looks at the speaker, focuses on understanding, suspends judgment, and sums up what the person has to say. People trust her and seem to be willing to tell her just about anything. But she also practices another skill that helps her to gather more information and increase her understanding of the person she's interviewing. She asks good questions. If you want to become an effective listener, become a good reporter, not a stick-the-microphone-in-your-face-and-bark-questions-at-your kind of reporter, but someone who gently asks follow-up questions and seeks clarification. If you show people how much you care and ask in a non-threatening way, you'll be amazed by how much they'll tell you. Finally, number nine, always make listening your priority. The last thing to remember when developing your listening skills is to make listening a priority, no matter how busy you become or how far you rise in your organization. A great example of a busy executive who made time for listening is the late Sam Walton, founder of Walmart and one of the richest men in America. He believed in listening to what people had to say, especially his employees. He once flew his plane to Mount Pleasant, Texas, landed, and gave instructions to his co-pilot to meet him about a 100 miles down the road. He then rode in a Walmart truck the rest of the way, just so that he could chat with the driver. We should all give listening that kind of priority. The ability to listen is something many people take for granted today. Most people consider listening to be easy, and they see themselves as pretty good listeners. But while it's true that most people are able to hear... Fewer are capable of really listening. In our careers, we have done a lot of speaking. Between the two of us, we speak to several hundred thousand people every year. And Jim's wife, Nancy, does a lot of speaking, too. And believe me, she's a great talker. But she's also a wonderful listener. And sometimes when she speaks, she talks about communication and the importance of listening. Not long ago, she did a talk about listening, which emphasized giving other people the benefit of doubt and trying to see things from their point of view. In the audience that day was a man named Rodney. Though he was happily married and had a young son, he had been previously married and had two daughters with his first wife, and he was having a lot of problems with her. She was constantly calling him and asking for more money for herself and the two girls. They argued continually, 
and she was driving him nuts, so much that he had already hired an attorney and was preparing to sue her. But when Rodney heard Nancy speak about listening that day, he realized how insensitive he had been to his ex-wife, Charlotte. A couple of days later, he called her and asked if they could meet. She was, of course, suspicious of Rodney, and even asked her attorney to call him to find out what he was up to. But eventually Rodney convinced them that he just wanted to talk, and finally Charlotte agreed to see him. They met at a coffee shop, and Rodney said, Charlotte, I want to listen to you. Tell me what your life is like. I do care about you and the kids. I didn't think you cared about the girls at all, she said, and she began to cry. I do, he said. I'm sorry. I've only been thinking of myself, and I haven't been thinking of you. Please forgive me. Why are you doing this, she asked. Because I want to make things right, he answered. I've been angry for so long that I couldn't see straight. Now tell me how things are going for you and the girls. For a while, all Charlotte could do was sob. But then she started telling him about her struggles as a single parent and how she was doing her best to bring up the girls, but that it didn't seem like enough. They talked for hours, and as they did, the beginning of a new foundation of mutual respect began to form. In time, they believe that they will be able to become friends again. Rodney is probably not alone. You may also have people in your life that you would like to make some changes with. Who haven't you been listening to lately? And what are you going to do about it? It's never too late to become a good listener. It can change your life and the lives of the people in your life. Chapter number five. A person of influence understands people. The other night over dinner, the two of us got to talking and we started to explore some questions. How does a person build an organization? What does it take? What is the key to becoming successful? For example, what did it take for a person like Jim to build a business organization that's active in 26 countries and impacts the lives of hundreds of thousands of people? And for John, what did it take to triple the size of his church, making it the largest in its denomination, and in the process increase its budget from around $800,000 to over $5 million and raise active involvement by volunteers from just 112 to over 1,800 people? we found that it doesn't matter whether your business is creating computer software, building a church, running a business, serving food in a restaurant, building houses, or designing airplanes. The key to success is understanding people. That's right. John and I are very different. I didn't grow up with an orientation toward people as he did. He took Dale Carnegie courses while he was still in high school and went off to college knowing he would be in a people job but I went to Purdue University and studied aeronautical engineering. By the time I finished with my bachelor's degree, I thought there were two keys to success in any job, hard work and technical skills. It never even occurred to me that people skills had any value. I entered my first job ready to work and loaded with technical knowledge. Purdue had given me a first-rate education, and I had always believed in working hard, but it didn't take me long to realize that success in business means being able to work with people. In fact, all of life is dealing with people. I found that to be true not only professionally as an engineer, a consultant, and an entrepreneur, but in every aspect of living, whether I was interacting with my family, working with one of my kids' teachers, or socializing with friends. If you can't understand people and work with them, you can't accomplish anything, and you certainly can't become a person of influence. The ability to understand people is one of the greatest assets anyone can ever have. It has the potential to positively impact every area of your life, not just in the business arena. David Burns, a medical doctor and a professor of psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania, says, The biggest mistake you can make in trying to talk convincingly is to put your highest priority on expressing your ideas and feelings. What most people really want is to be listened to, respected, and understood. The moment people see that they are being understood, they become more motivated to understand your point of view. If you can learn to understand people, how they think, what they feel, what inspires them, how they're likely to act and react in a given situation, then you can motivate and influence them in a positive way. Lack of understanding for others is a huge source of tension in society today. But if understanding is such a great asset, why don't more people practice it? 
There are many reasons. Fear, self-centeredness, failure to appreciate one another's differences, and failure to acknowledge the things we have in common, to name just a few. Knowing what people need and want is really the key to understanding them. And if you can understand them, you can influence them and impact their lives in a positive way. If we were to boil down all the things we know about understanding people and narrow them down to a short list, we'd identify these five things. Number one, everybody wants to be somebody. There isn't a person in the world who doesn't have the desire to be someone, to have significance. Even the least ambitious and unassuming person wants to be regarded highly by others. John, do you remember the first time feelings were stirred up inside of you to be someone important? I sure do, Jim. It was when I went to my first basketball game when I was nine years old. I can still see it in my head. I stood with my buddies in the balcony of the gym. The thing that I remember most wasn't the game. It was the announcement of the starting lineups. They turned out all the lights, and then some spotlights came on. Then the announcer called out the names of the starters, and they ran out into the middle of the floor one by one with everybody in the place cheering. I hung over the balcony that day and said, Wow, I'd like that to happen to me. In fact, by the time the introductions were over, I looked over to my friend Bobby Wilson and I said, Bobby, when I get to high school, they're going to announce my name and I'm going to run out in the spotlight to the middle of the basketball floor and the people are going to cheer for me because I'm going to become somebody. I went home that night and I told my dad, I want to be a basketball player. Soon afterward, he got me a Spalding basketball and we put a goal on the garage. For the next several years, I used to shovel snow off that driveway to practice my foul shots and play basketball because I had a dream of becoming somebody. It's funny how that kind of dream can impact your life. I remember in the sixth grade, we played intramural basketball, and our team won a couple of games, so we got to go to the old Mill Street gym in Circleville, Ohio, where I had seen that basketball game in the fourth grade. When we got there... Instead of going out onto the floor with the rest of the players as they were warming up, I went over to the bench where those high school players had been two years before. I sat right where they had, and I closed my eyes. (laughs) That's the equivalent of turning the lights out in the gym. Then in my head, I heard my name announced, and I ran out into the middle of the floor. It felt so good to hear that imaginary applause that I thought, I'll do it again. (laughs) So I did. In fact... I did it three times, and all of a sudden I realized that my buddies weren't playing basketball. They were just watching me in disbelief. But I didn't care, because I was one step closer to being the person I dreamed about becoming. Everybody has that desire to feel important, to be regarded and valued by others. Everybody wants to be somebody. Once that piece of information becomes a part of your everyday thinking you'll gain incredible insight into why people do the things they do. And if you treat every person you meet as if he were the most important person in the world, you'll communicate that he is somebody to you. The second thing we know about people is that nobody cares how much you know until he knows how much you care. That is so true. One of the most important things you need to know as an influencer is that you've got to love people before you try to lead them. The moment that people know that you care for and about them, the way they feel about you changes. Showing others that you care isn't easy. Your greatest times and fondest memories will come because of people, but so will your most difficult, painful, and tragic times. People are your greatest asset and your greatest liability. The challenge is to keep caring about them no matter what. If you want to help others and become a person of influence, Then you've got to keep smiling, sharing, giving, and turning the other cheek. That's the right way to treat people. Besides, you never know which people in your sphere of influence are going to rise up and make a difference in your life and the lives of others. Number three, everybody needs somebody. Contrary to popular belief, there are no such things as self-made men and women. Everybody needs friendship, encouragement, and help. What people can accomplish by themselves is almost nothing compared to the potential they have when working with others. And doing things with other people tends to bring contentment. Besides, lone rangers are rarely happy people. As King Solomon of ancient Israel said, 
Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can pick him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Everybody needs somebody to come alongside them and help them. If you understand that, are willing to give to others and help them, and maintain the right motives, it can change their lives and yours. Number four, everybody can be somebody when somebody understands and believes in him. It doesn't take much effort to help other people feel important. Little things done deliberately at the right time can make a big difference. That's true, Jim. As you know, for 14 years, I was privileged to pastor a very large congregation at Skyline Church in the San Diego area, where we did a Christmas program every year. We used to do 28 performances, and altogether about 30,000 people saw it each year. The show always included a bunch of children, and one of my favorite parts of the show several years ago was a song in which about 300 kids dressed like angels sang while holding candles. Toward the end of the song, they walked off the stage, came up the aisle, and exited out the lobby in front of the church. During the first performance, I decided to wait for them back in the lobby. They didn't know I was going to be there, but as they went by, I clapped, praised them, and said, Kids, you did a great job. They were surprised to see me, and they looked up and said, Hi, Pastor. Hi. Hey, look. Pastor's here. For the second performance, I did the same thing again, and I could see as they started to walk up the aisles, that they were looking back expectantly to see if I was standing there to cheer them on. By the third performance of the night, as they turned the corner to come up the aisle, they had smiles on their faces. And when they got to the lobby, they were giving me high fives and we were having a great time. Why? Because they knew I believed in them. And it made all of them feel like they were somebody. When was the last time you went out of your way to make people feel special? like they were somebody. It doesn't really take much. The investment required on your part is totally overshadowed by the impact it makes on them. Everyone you know and all the people you meet have the potential to be someone important in the lives of others. All they need is encouragement and motivation from you to help them reach their potential. Finally, number five, anybody who helps somebody influences a lot of bodies. The final thing you need to understand about people is that when you help one person, you're really impacting a lot of other people. That's because what you give to one person overflows into the lives of all the people that that person impacts. The nature of influence is to multiply. It impacts the person you touch and the people that he or she in turn touches. It even impacts you, because when you help others and your motives are good, you always get back more than you can ever give. Most people are so genuinely grateful when another person makes them feel like they're somebody special that they never tire of showing their gratitude. In the end, the ability to understand people is a choice. It's true that some people are born with great instincts that enable them to understand how others think and feel. But even if you aren't an instinctive people person, you can improve your ability to work with others. The ability to understand, motivate, and ultimately influence others is a skill that every person is capable of having. Jim was recently reminded of the importance of understanding people and seeing things from their perspective when visiting his aging parents in New York recently. Uh, my parents are in their late 80s, and they worked hard all their lives. Growing up, we always lived in a very small house, and after my parents retired, they sold it and moved to a small apartment to live on their modest pensions. Like most people who have been blessed financially, Nancy and I are always looking for ways to help our parents and repay them in some small way for the positive things they have done for us over the years. Recently, we thought we could help them by leasing them a penthouse unit in the most prestigious apartment building in the city. It was incredible and even had a view of Niagara Falls. But after about six months, my parents asked if they could move out. My mother's eyesight was so poor that she couldn't see the falls. Dad, on the other hand, could see the falls fine, but was made extremely uncomfortable by being up so high. We were disappointed that they didn't like it, 
but we readily agreed to move them back into their small apartment. My desire to help them was still strong, so one day after we got them squared away in their place, I took Mom to the store. Though she claimed she didn't need anything, I did manage to talk her into letting me get her a few items, a new trash can, some flatware, a small radio, and a new toaster. Nancy and I had wanted to get them big things, but that's not what was important to them. They were happy with the toaster. Oh yes, there was one other item they finally admitted that they could use, a small tree for the front of their apartment. They thought it would be nice to have some shade in the summer when they sat outside. But they're so expensive, my mom said. Just get us a little sapling. We wanted them to have shade today, not 15 years from now, so we went out and got them the biggest tree we could find. It didn't take a lot of money to make them happy, just a little understanding. Not everyone learns that lesson. Lots of people spend their lives trying to push their own agenda, and then they wonder why they have no pull with others. The key to making an impact on others is to find out what people want and then help them get it. That's what motivates them, and that's what makes it possible for you to become a person of influence in their lives. Chapter 6. A Person of Influence Enlarges People Over the years, my wife Nancy and I have learned a lot from our son Eric. He's been through more than 30 individual brain operations, but that's never stopped him from being mentally sharp and full of optimism. And his great sense of humor keeps us all entertained. During one of his many surgeries, Eric experienced an interoperative stroke. The resulting loss of muscle balance has limited the use of his right hand and given him severe curvature of the spine. After a couple of years, that required another surgery in which the doctors performed spinal fusion and implanted steel rods from the base of his neck all the way down to his pelvis. He spent three months in a full body cast during his recovery, and as a result, many of his previous abilities were reduced dramatically. But Eric came through it all with characteristically positive spirits. After Eric's spinal surgery, Nancy could no longer handle him alone, so we decided it was time to employ a full-time home attendant to lift